Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. <clears throat> Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord, now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bounds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord, now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Okay, I uh, will read our sermon text here, but before I do, I want to uh, mention one more time. I think everybody here knows this, but just in case somebody walked in that I'm not registering, there's a rose in back. Every lady can take a rose, and if there's any left, my wife will get some. So, uh, but please, uh, unless your your husband says don't take a rose, I'm your Valentine, then I don't want to get in any trouble there. But I did buy extra roses for all the ladies. And um, uh, we have on the wall, uh, one person noticed it. I don't think anybody else did. We have a new depiction from my grandmother, which my mother brought. I didn't know that we had. And it is a, get this, it is a depiction of the people of Israel going on a pilgrim feast. And that happens to be what we're going to be preaching on today. She brought this in. I, it was not planned this way. She just brought in and said, here, you hang this on the wall. And it happens to be the exact sermon that I'm preaching on today. It's the people going down, the one on the very, the very left. We see the, 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 the lambs at the bottom and all the people in the throng? They're coming on a pilgrim feast. So you're going to learn about that today. And it, the Lord is so good to make these things happen like that. So here we go. Here is our um, sermon text is Exodus 23, verses 10 through 19. Uh, Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. Um, Verse 14, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time of the appointed, uh, at the time appointed in the month of Aviv, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the feast first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Interesting stuff, isn't it? Okay, since Exodus chapter 20 and the giving of the Ten Commandments, we have gone through nine sermons, including this one. There is a pattern which runs through those chapters, which is ac actually quite remarkable. Yes, there are parallelisms, and there is at least one chiasm that I showed you for the past couple weeks. There's probably more. But there are also sets of tens within the major subject areas that we have looked at. Bible scholar Ernest Bertho discovered these patterns. These sets of tens continue right through to the end of Exodus chapter 23. I have not followed these patterns for the sermons because there are other aspects of the passages that I've been focused on. 
but I'd like you to at least know them. And so I'm going to read you the main subject categories as he has them laid out. Understand now that each of these divides beautifully into 10 individual points. It's really rather remarkable to see. The first one is the right of personal freedom. It's Exodus 21, 1 through 11. After that, on murder and bodily injuries, sins against the life of one's neighbor, Exodus 21, 12 through 27. Following that, injuries resulting from relations of property, through property, and of property, acts of carelessness and theft. That would be Exodus 21, 28 through 22, 6. Things entrusted and things lost is Exodus 22, 7 through 17. Unnatural crimes, religious and inhumane abominations is Exodus 22, 18 through uh, 22, 31. Judicial proceedings is Exodus 23, 1 through 9, which we saw last week. And then rules for holidays and festivals, Exodus 23, 10 through 19, which we're looking at today. And then the promises, which is Exodus 23, 20 through 33. Today we're going to look at Exodus 23, 10 through 19, and I will use his breakdown of it into 10 separate ordinances so that you can see the pattern revealed. Some people love patterns. Some people couldn't care, but they should be important to us for at least one significant reason. If all of these patterns, we have this very detailed list of tens, we have parallelisms, we have chiasms, if all of these different things and on and on and on are here, then either Moses was the most intelligent writer in all of human history, or these truly are the very words of God. It is beyond comprehension to think that one man could develop themes like this and also pack in all of the information that is both pictorial and prophetic that we keep discovering week after week after week. What a priceless gem we have here. Let us ever appreciate it for what it truly is, God's precious word. Our text verse today comes from Colossians chapter 2. It's verses 16 and 17. He writes there, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Today, we will look at the ordinances for the holidays and festivals. Each of these was given to Israel to show us pictures of Jesus. The nation lived out these pictures without even realizing it. And we are the blessed ones who can now see what was hidden from them. These holidays and festivals are fulfilled in Christ, and thus they are set aside. Paul tells us this, but we can still learn much from them, and so let's do just that. It's all to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have two thoughts for you today. The first is times of Sabbath rest. It's verses 10 through 13. The placement and structure of these verses is beautiful. The last set of verses, 1 through 9, dealt with justice towards others, and they had a very strong focus on the poor. These verses deal with holidays, religious festivals, and set times of life, but even though they do, the first ones are named specifically in regards to the poor. Thus, they make a transition between the two sets of tens which are laid out. All of these verses are laid down in intricately beautiful patterns and with purpose. We have seen a chiasm which flows through them, and we have seen how chapters 20 through 23 are developed based on patterns of tens as well. In addition, the patterns of tens overlap with a gradual melting together of each set of tens. The Ten Commandments were laid out in chapter 20, and then eight sets of tens are laid out between chapters 21 through 23. There is immense wisdom in the structure of these laws which have been given. Verse 10, six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. This is the first ordinance. Verses 10 and 11 together comprise the first ordinance. It is divided into two sections, just as the week is. There is the prescription that work is to be done for the first six years. You shall sow your land and gather in its produce. This is a positive mandate to actively work the land, sowing and reaping as it produces its harvest. This includes anything which the land produces, whether it is grains, fruits, or vegetables. The people were to work towards their rest. It is like the week leading to the Sabbath, a picture of man working 6,000 years towards his rest during the millennium. Both of these picture the same thing. 
It was to be a time of productivity and diligence while waiting for a time of change in what was to be done. The land was given to them and it was to be used as they pleased and with the intent of producing wealth and prosperity. Verse 11, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow. The Hebrew verb for let it rest is shamat. This is the first of just nine times that it's going to be used. It means to let go or to drop down. The idea is that as one opens their hand and lets something fall out of it, so the people were to let the labors of the field drop out of their hands. The word is associated with the noun shemita, which means remission. That is used only five times in the Bible and only in Deuteronomy. As a noun, it signifies the year of release. The verb in this verse is the action of letting it be released. During the seventh year, the cycle of sowing and reaping, or even just plucking what comes up without care, such as fruits on the tree, was to be completely disregarded. All was to remain lying fallow, and the reason for it is given. Verse 11 continues, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. The poor here in Hebrew is evyon. It means needy, and this is the second time that it is seen. The first was in verse 6 of last week. This admonition follows directly and naturally after the verses of justice from last week, many of which dealt with the poor. Those who had no land or were destitute were given all of the rights to whatever popped up from the fields during this seventh year. Further, the beasts of the field could come in and they could eat anything which grew. The land was to be given over entirely to these two categories and no profit was to be made off of it for the owners of the land. Again, it is a marvelous picture of what we see in the 6,000 years of man working towards the millennial reign of Christ. Each of the redeemed has his own responsibility for sharing Christ. The care of the person and the field they minister in will reap according to their efforts. But in the millennium, meaning the last thousand year period where Christ reigns, there will be no need to minister as in times past. Isaiah describes what it will be like in Isaiah chapter 2. It says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Verse 11 continues, In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive groves. This is the second use of zayit or olive in the Bible. It hasn't been mentioned since Genesis 8 verse 11, when the dove that Noah released returned with an olive branch in its mouth. Now it is reintroduced here. The offering of peace with man from the Lord is now expected to be an offering of peace to one's poor and needy fellow man. Thus it was honoring of the Lord who is the Prince of Peace. The vineyards and the olive groves would continue to put forth their fruits at a normal rate, and so this would be an enormous blessing for the poor. In fact, with what they could harvest in this seventh year, if they were industrious, they could work their way entirely out of poverty. Again, it is emblematic of the millennium where all will be able to receive the full benefits of what God offers as Christ rules from Jerusalem. This law of the year of rest is further defined in Leviticus 25 verses 3 through 7. Here's what it says. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall, you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. What grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine, for it is a year of rest for the land. And the Sabbath produce of the land shall be food for you, for you, your male and female servants, your hired man and the stranger who dwells with you, for your livestock and the beasts that are in your land, all its produce shall be for food. This seventh year where everything was to lie fallow was unique in all the world. And it may have seemed contrary to what seems profitable. And in fact, it may seem that some of it would be harmful to the society to follow this mandate. But the Lord promised them that such would not be the case. 
Leviticus 25 verses 20 through 22 shows this. It says, and if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? Since we shall not sow nor gather in our produce, then I will command my blessings on you in the sixth year and it will bring forth produce enough for three years. Then you shall sow in the eighth year and eat old produce until the ninth year. Until its produce comes in, you shall eat of the old harvest. Instead of focusing on the earthly, this year was to be different. They were given a command for a different focus, a spiritual one for the seventh year. This is detailed in Deuteronomy where it says this, and Moses commanded them saying at the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that you may hear and that you may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you crossed the Jordan to possess. Now, before I go on, I want to ask everybody here, how would you feel about not reading your Bible for seven years? I couldn't do it for one day. I literally can't. And they were given the law once every seven years. Imagine that. But they were to stand there and listen to it and learn to obey the Lord their God. I don't know how they could function in that way. They, the priests knew the law and they could interpret it to them. But I need to have it every day. As the psalmist says, you know, it's my daily food. It's, it's what I want to live on. Anyway, this law of the sabbatical year was given to show that the Lord was the landowner. And that the people were his tenants. They were expected to conform to his laws and believe in his promises. During the seventh year, it is not said that they cannot work, only that they cannot work in harvesting. If they wished, they could keep as productive as they wanted and earn anything that they wanted as they saw fit. But they were not to violate the edict of letting the land lie fallow and not harvesting what came up on its own. The Lord was so adamant about this that in Leviticus chapter 26, it is included among the curses of the people for disobedience. Here's what it says. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate. It shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. And because the people failed to obey, the Lord kept his promise for their disobedience. This is recorded in 2 Chronicles. It says, And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the king of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. If 70 years of exile equates to 70 violations of this law of the observance of sabbatical years, then they violated this law more than they kept it prior to the exile. For at least 490 years, they failed to keep this mandate. It is a sad commentary on Israel that they failed to trust his promises and they failed to obey his precepts. It is noted by a later historian that the after the exile, observing this year became regular within Israel. Tacitus records the observance and Josephus notes that Julius Caesar actually permitted the custom and he excused the Jews from paying tribute during this sabbatical year. However, with their rejection of Jesus Christ, following the law could never save them. They first disobeyed the law and they were exiled. And then they rejected the grace of the Lord Jesus and they were again exiled. They are all well too suited to be the poor of the land who so desperately need what the millennial reign of Christ will so freely offer to them. Verse 12, six days you shall do your work and on the seventh day you shall rest that your ox and your donkey may rest and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. This is the second ordinance. The Sabbath, which was mandated in the 10 commandments is readdressed here to show that there is a system with purpose and with intent there is the weekly Sabbath. There is the sabbatical year. There will be a year of Jubilee, which is an ending of seven periods of sabbatical years. And then there is the millennial time frame of 6,000 years leading up to the final thousand years. Within these occurrences are other dates, countless dates, which revolve around these set times. 
There's immense order and harmony in how God has laid out the redemptive workings of Scripture in the stream of time in which we live. The word for work here is not the same as the word for work when the fourth command was given. Both are general terms, but this one is probably different in order to demonstrate that there was no exemption from the Sabbath day even during a Sabbath year. Also, there are two words translated as rest in this one verse. The first is Shabbat and the second is Nuach. The second gives the positive idea of resting. And so for a mental idea of what is being said, I will paraphrase this for you. And on the seventh day, you shall observe the Sabbath so that your ox and your donkey may rest and be refreshed. And after that, a third word is used for refreshed. It is nafash. This is a verb used for the first of only four times in the whole Bible. It is from a primitive root meaning to breathe or passively to be breathed on. In this, we could say, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may catch their breath. This unusual word again points to the millennium of Christ. Peter says this to the people of Israel in Acts chapter 3. He says, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. You see how this is tying directly into the millennium when Israel has accepted the Lord and he returns to rule among them. Whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things, I'm continuing on, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. The Greek words that Peter used, kairoi anapsixios, means exactly the same thing as what Moses says here. They are times of recovering of breath or a refreshing. Each line here continuously points us towards Christ and towards his work. The times of refreshing that Peter speaks of is the kingdom age. It is the millennial reign of Jesus. Concerning this mandate in comparison to the fourth commandment, Charles Ellicott notes this. Nothing is added to the requirements of the fourth commandment. But the merciful intention of the Sabbath day is more fully brought out. It is to be kept in order that the cattle may rest, the slave and the stranger may be refreshed. His words are correct. And again, they perfectly match what is expected during the millennial reign. It is a time of mercy on the world. What is stated here for the Sabbath is reflective of the millennium as Isaiah describes it from Isaiah 11. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall neither, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Verse 13, And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your mouth. This precept seems kind of out of place considering what is supposed to be a tenfold list of holidays and festivals, but it is not. It is to the Lord that these holidays and festivals were to be observed. By prohibiting the speaking of the names of other gods, they were signifying that there is but one God who is to be acknowledged, Jehovah. However, there is the modern Jewish practice of killing the Lord's name by silence. They do not speak his name, but rather refer to him as Adonai, or my Lord. But the active speaking of his name, Yehovah, or some people say Yahweh, and the refusal to speak the name of any other God is perfectly fulfilled in the millennial picture that we've been developing. Throughout the world, there are supposedly many gods. But the words of Zechariah show us the fulfillment of this verse we're looking at in Exodus. It says in Zechariah 14, And the Lord, meaning Yehovah, shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord, Jehovah, is one, and his name one. 
Each verse is pointed to this marvelous time on earth, which is surely coming soon to a millennial reign near you. A time of rest is what we hope for, a time when our labors will cease. And in Jesus, we have passed through the door. In him is found our rest and our eternal peace. For those at the end of the ages, when the tribulation ends and wars finally cease, the realization of the rest promised in the Bible's pages will come upon them. They will behold the Prince of Peace. He shall rule from Zion among Israel, and from him the law will go out, disputing will cease. In that day it shall all be well, as the world is granted its blessed time of peace. Our second thought today is the pilgrim feasts. It's verses 14 through 19. Verse 14, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. The third ordinance. It is the mandating of three feasts to the Lord each year. Although the Passover and unleavened bread have already been man mandated, excuse me, this is the first mention of the three annual feasts in the Bible. The word times here, as in three times, is the word regalim, the plural of the word regel, which it means foot. Thus, regalim means footbeats. Just as the footbeats fall in regular succession, so these feasts were to be just as regular for the people. Very you know, uh, graphic in its uh, use, the Hebrew, the language is just wonderful. The word for feast here is Chagag, which indicates a pilgrim feast. They were to travel to a set location for the feast. In this, there is a vivid mental picture of the footbeats of the pilgrims for the pilgrim feast. Men would regularly travel to meet with the Lord. Verse 15, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Aviv, for in it you came out of Egypt. The fourth ordinance, Hamatzot, or the feast of unleavened bread. It is the first of the three mandated pilgrim feasts. The feast follows immediately after Passover and lasted for seven days. The first day and the last day of the feast were holy convocations, and for all seven days, unleavened bread was to be eaten. As noted, when we looked at that feast, when it was first mandated, it is a picture of our time in Christ. He died for us as our Passover lamb. And when we accept what he did, we enter into Christ and are thus deemed sinless before God. We are, as Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, truly unleavened. We were brought out of bondage to sin and the devil, pictured by Egypt, and are now the redeemed of the Lord, considered as sinless, pictured by the unleavened bread, meaning without yeast. The Lord is showing a picture of the redemption of his people through these mandated observances and feasts. Verse 15 continues, none shall appear before me empty. The word empty is rekam, empty-handed or vain. The last time the word was used was in Exodus 3, verse 21, when the Lord promised that Israel would not come out of Egypt empty-handed. So will I stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go rekam, or empty-handed. It seems that the use is intentional here. Just as I brought you out of Egypt with hands that were not empty, so you shall come before me with hands that are not empty. To do so would be a vain thing. This seems certain because later in Deuteronomy, this mandate is going to apply to all three pilgrim feasts, but it's only noted with this feast now. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. For now, he is teaching them that what he has done for them is to involve like return to him when they appear before him. This feast was to be held immediately after the Passover, from the evening of the 14th day of the month of Aviv until the evening of the 21st day of the same month, as is noted in Exodus 12, verse 18. Verse 16, and the feast of harvest, the feast of first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field. The fifth ordinance, hakatsir, or the harvest. This is the second of the three pilgrim feasts. 
It's also going to be called Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks because it was celebrated seven weeks after another feast which will be mandated in the book of Leviticus. It is held on the 50th day after that feast which corresponds to the 50th day after the first Passover when the law was received at Sinai. Later, it will be 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, but the first one, there was no Feast of First Fruits. In Greek, it is called Pentecost, and thus it pictures the sealing of believers with the Holy Spirit upon belief in the work of Jesus Christ. There is the giving of the law at Sinai, which is replaced by the giving of the New Covenant Holy Spirit. It is the indwelling of God in man. The word for First Fruits is Bikarim. This is the first of 18 times it's going to be used in the Old Testament. And it comes from a verb, bakar, which means to bear new fruit or to consecrate as firstborn. This is referring to the wheat harvest, which comes after the barley harvest. The wheat was considered the more valuable grain. And it is the grain which is used to refer to you, the redeemed of the Lord. Thus, this feast is a picture of those in Christ during the church age and who will be taken at the rapture. Paul speaks of this in the book of Romans. He says, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together to eat until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Interestingly, what they were to bring when they appeared to the Lord is later mandated in Leviticus chapter 23. There it says these words, you shall bring from your dwellings two loaves of two tenths of an epa. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. In only one of two times in all of the law, yeast or leaven was to be presented to the Lord. In the case of this particular feast, two loaves of baked bread with leaven. The loaves, what is that picture? all of the redeemed of the Lord, two loaves, Jew and Gentile. This feast initiates the wheat harvest, which continues on until the next feast. The Lord was to receive them, even with leaven, just as the Lord has received us, both Jew and Gentile, with sin still in our lives. We are consecrated as holy and counted sinless because of the work of Christ. And you think these are just obscure verses that mean nothing. Everything pictures Jesus Christ in his work. Every single word, every detail. It's marvelous. The author of Hebrews also reveals the status of those in Christ as the consecrated firstborn. Here's what he says. But you have come to Mount Zion into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, the the, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. What Israel was asked to do at these feasts only pictures the greater work of Christ in redemptive history. Their regular lives as directed by the Lord, what they did, when they did it, and how they conducted themselves was all given to show us so very much more concerning ourselves and our own lives in Jesus Christ. Verse 16 going on, Then the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field, the six ordinates. ha asif for the ingathering. This word asif is used only here and in Exodus 34 verse 22. When the feast is mentioned elsewhere, it's called something entirely different, Sukkot or tabernacles. It is referring to the ending of the harvest season when the labors of the people are gathered in from the field. The dating for this feast will later be fixed at the 15th day of the seventh month and it will last for seven days. This corresponds to around October in our calendar. There are various crops that grow in Israel throughout the summer months and by this time they are almost all harvested. Generally, the last crops to be gathered are the grapes, the figs, the pomegranates, the almonds, and the olives. At the time when these harvests are accomplished, the people were to celebrate this feast as their labors for the year had come to an end. At the end of the instructions for the feasts of the Lord in Leviticus 23, this addendum is noted. Also on the 50th day of the seventh month, 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. 
On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day of the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. They still do this to this day in Israel. All who are natives, native Israelites, shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The Feast of Tabernacles is fulfilled in Christ. He, having put on a tent of flesh and dwelt among us. This pilgrim feast, then, is the fulfillment of the prophetic plan for man. After all of the harvests, all of the redeemed who have been brought out of spiritual Egypt, the bondage of sin, will be gathered together to dwell with the Lord during the millennium. There is an order to these three feasts. The Passover initiates the process, Christ's death for his people. The first feast is our position in Christ because of his work. We are counted sinless. The second is the granting of the Holy Spirit because of that declaration of being counted sinless. And the third is the harvesting of the redeemed, the ingathering of the people of the Lord. As this feast says, it is at the end of the year. It is when the cycle is complete and the redemption of God's people is to be finally realized in its fullness. Although two of these feasts will be given different names later, they are given as a wide brushstroke here of what the Lord is doing throughout redemptive history. Verse 17, three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. The seventh ordinance. Although this is similar to verse 14, it does have differences. The word four times here, three times in the year, is different. In verse 14, it was regalim or footbeats. Here it is pa'am or strokes. The word elsewhere is translated as anvil. We get the idea of a regular stroke three times or strokes a year. This was to occur at the times that were set. The mental images that we can make here is that the footbeats of the people were to occur at the times when the anvil strikes. Unlike verse 14, it identifies that it is the males who are to appear. This doesn't mean that women and children couldn't go, and the Bible does record that they did, but it was obligatory for the males. In Deuteronomy 16, it presupposes that the entire family would go. It also identifies there what the term the end of the year means for the Feast of Ingathering. Here's what it says. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press. Then you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant and the Levite, the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the works of your hands so that you surely rejoice. Now imagine he promised these things and they failed to do them. But imagine how they would have lived if they had continued on just the blessings that he promises. He's such a good God. The end of the year means the end of the harvest cycle. Also, unlike verse 14, which said a feast to me, here it says that they shall appear before the Lord God. They were to recognize that it was to Jehovah, the God of Israel, to whom they were to appear. They were thus times of intimate meeting with him. One might think that this wouldn't be a prudent thing to do, though. By all of the males observing these feasts, the land would be left defenseless. However, that involved faith in the word of the Lord, just as observing the sabbatical year did. In the explanation of these feasts in Exodus 34, this promise is included. Three times a year. All your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you and enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times a year. He told him in advance, you'll be safe if you come and do these things. From here, the following three verses seem out of place and hardly in line with the holiday and festival requirements. But they are in fact logical and orderly. They reflect a portion of these feasts. Verse 18, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. The eighth ordinance. There is a dispute as to what this verse means. Does it mean any sacrifice or only the Passover? 
It is repeated in Exodus 34 with only a few differences. There it says this, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, nor shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until morning. In these two verses, the blood is the object of what is offered instead of the sacrifice. You shall not offer the blood. As the Bible says that the life is in the blood, and because grain offerings were considered separate offerings than sacrifices, it is referring only to the Passover, which is a type of Christ's cross. Thus it is called my sacrifice. Leaven was to be completely purged from the home prior to the slaughtering of the Passover. Thus it is a picture of the sinless Christ who shed his blood for us. There was no sin to be found in him, just as there was no leaven to be found in the homes of those who partook of the Passover. The second half of this verse is incorrectly translated. The word translated here as sacrifice is chag. It is a completely different word than the first half, which is zebach. This word chag means feast, not sacrifice. Thus, the King James Version and the New King James Version get a demerit in their Bible translations. The lamb is my sacrifice and the Passover is my feast. It is a feast to the Lord and there was to be nothing left of the lamb by morning time. That was explained in Exodus chapter 12 with these words, you shall not let none of it remain until morning and what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. This verse then corresponds to the first of the three pilgrim feasts, the Passover. It is tied directly into the feast of unleavened bread. Again, each verse has been used to direct us to Christ. He is the object and the fulfillment of every precept that we have looked at today. Verse 19, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. The ninth ordinance, the word first is translated a few ways, the first, the best, the beginning, etc. The word is rashit. It means the first either in place, time, order, or rank. What it is referring to is the first to mature. Before any grain was harvested for self, the first harvested was to be offered to the Lord without any delay. The offering that is specified for the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost mentioned above is this. It was the first of the harvest which was to be brought to the Lord in the form of two loaves made with yeast. Interestingly, in the New Testament, there are two mentions by Paul of the first fruits from Achaia. The first is mentioned in Romans 16, verse 5, where it says this, Greet my beloved Epineatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. The second is in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that he is the first fruits of Achaia. Epineatus is believed to be a Jew. The name is the same as the Hebrew Judah or praise. And so it is believed that he used his Hebrew name among the Hebrews and his Greek name among the Greeks as often happened in those days. Stephanas is a Gentile. More interestingly, the name Achaia, where they both were from, has the same general meaning as the meaning of Egypt. Egypt or Mitzrayim is a plural of the word which means double distress or double grief. Achaia means grief. Thus, these two are called the first fruits of grief. They are a picture of the first redeemed out of the world of grief, just as Israel was redeemed out of Egypt, or double distress. These two men show the fulfillment of the two loaves of bread with yeast being presented to the Lord at this feast, Jew and Gentile. Returning the first fruits to the Lord is a picture of the first fruits of the redeemed being noted as such in the New Testament. It's astonishing. It is just astonishing that every single thing that's happening in the Old Testament is fulfilled somewhere in the New and normally at the hand of Paul. This verse then corresponds to the second of the three pilgrim feasts. The offering of the first fruits is tied directly into the Feast of Harvest. Verse 19 finishes with these words, You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. This is the tenth ordinance. As the previous two precepts were tied into the first two pilgrim feasts, then it's logical that this is tied into the final pilgrim feast, that of ingathering. This verse is one of cleanliness and what is acceptable and holy to God. We know this because all of verse 19 is repeated verbatim in Exodus 34, verse 26. But the second half of it, meaning this portion about boiling a young goat in its mother's milk, is also repeated verbatim in Deuteronomy 14, verse 21. 
That section of Deuteronomy is dealing specifically with clean and unclean meat. It is true that this verse is one of mercy and respect rather than contempt of God's creatures, but there's much more to it than that. It is accepted that this command refers to an ancient superstitious practice which came at the close of the harvest season. The people would boil a kid in its mother's milk and after that, along with magic rites, the milk was sprinkled on plantations and fields and gardens in hopes of being more productive the next year. This then refers to those at the end of the age who refuse to give up magic practices. This is seen in the words of Revelation chapter 9. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, they did not repent of their murderers, their magic acts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. As the Feast of Ingathering deals with the final gathering in of all people after the tribulation period, then it is an admonition for those who are to be considered cleansed and acceptable for entering the millennium. We know this is after the tribulation because this feast comes after the grape harvest, which is the harvest of wrath. But this is what it says after that terrible time on earth. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Those who miss the rapture and who enter the tribulation need to reject the mark of the beast in order to be saved. Instead of following the unholy practices which this rite pictures, they will become holy because of their faithful witness, even to death. As you can see, the entire passage today pictures redemptive history from the time of Christ's cross at the Passover right up until the time of the millennial reign of Christ. What Israel observed in picture, Christ fulfilled in person. And we are the benefactors of the good which is promised. By a mere act of faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, our names are written on heaven's scroll we will be saved out of that terrible time to come upon the earth, and we will reign with Christ forever. Now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. If you have never made a commitment to this wonderful Lord who has done everything, every single thing necessary to secure you a place in heaven, let me tell you how you can, even right now. If I come up to you and I ask you the question, why should you be allowed to enter heaven? you should have no other answer than by the blood of Jesus Christ. I went to somebody yesterday at the projects and I asked her that question and she couldn't answer it. But after I got talking, she followed along. She was already <laughs> saved and did not how to know how to adequately explain what she already knew. And that's an admonition for every person here is that you need to not only know what it means to be saved, but you need to know how to tell other people what it means to be saved. And so these are the verses I give you week after week. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every single person here has sinned, and not only that, they have received Adam's original sin. We are condemned. It is done. There's nothing we need to go do to go to heck. We're on our way there anyway. The devil owns this earth. He has the title deed to it, as Bob so clearly showed today. Christ is the one that bought it back. All right? We are all sinful. And it says that the wages of sin is death. We die because we have sin. We die physically because of the sin that we commit in this life, but we're already born spiritually dead. David makes that perfectly clear in the Psalms when he says, I was sinful from my mother's womb. I was sinful from birth. Okay? We have inherited Adam's sin, and thus we are spiritually disconnected from God. All have sinned, and all fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. But, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He came to replace Adam. He fulfilled the law that we could not fulfill. And if we put our trust in him, then we will be saved. And trust implies something, faith. That is the only thing that we can give God. There is no other thing we can do and therefore works are excluded. No person will ever get to the throne and say, well, I got here because I'm a good guy. And that's the standard answer you get at almost every doorstep in America. I did this, I did that. I have merited this or that. God doesn't care about any of those things. It doesn't matter what you have done, what you have donated to this church or this charity or this, you know, uh, uh, whatever. God doesn't care because you're already tainted with sin. What he cares about is your faith in what he did. And then the good things you do will be reckoned to you. And not until then. All right. 
Final verse, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's all it takes. You just simply call out and say, I desperately need what he offers. I have sin, he doesn't, I want in, okay? That's all you need to do. If you haven't done it, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. We've got people dying all over the world. I had a great man of government die last night. You know, very unexpected, but it's sad because now we're going to have a real problem in this country if uh, he's not replaced with a normal thinking person. And there are very few of those left. So here you go. Our closing verse today comes from Psalm 84. It's verses 5 through 7. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage as they pass through the Valley of Baca. And the Valley of Baca is the Valley of Weeping. That's what we're in right now. We're on our pilgrim feast going through the Valley of Baca. They make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Great words, huh? Next week is Exodus 23. It's verses 20 through 33. How to maintain with the Lord sound relations? It's entitled Covenant Promises and Expectations. That'll be your 64th Exodus sermon. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. Darla, Joan, Pat, all of you ladies, happy Valentine's Day, right? He has a good plan and a purpose for you. Even if a deep ocean lies ahead of you, he can part the waters and he can lead you through it on dry ground. So follow him and trust him and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. Okay? I have a poem for you based on these verses. It's called Pictures of Redemptive History. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce as is normal to do. But the seventh year, please now understand, you shall let it rest and lie fallow, as I so instruct you, that the poor of your people may eat, as to you I now tell, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat as well. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove too. In six days you shall do your work in which you are blessed, and the seventh day you shall rest, that your rest may that may rest your ox and your donkey, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods. This you shall not do, nor let it be heard from your mouth. Be sure to pay attention. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. To me you shall come, to me drawing near. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days. As I commanded you, yes, as I have said, at the time appointed in the month of Aviv, following in my ways. For in it you came out of Egypt, you see. None shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest of your crops yield, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, at the time when the ground does yield, when you have gathered in what does appear, the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times in the year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. To me they shall draw near. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. You shall do this according to all that I have said. The feast of first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Do follow my instructions as if with them you have been shod. Wonderful pictures of Christ and his work for us are revealed in these set times and feasts of Israel. Every word shows us more hints of Jesus and of his marvelous works each does tell. Thank you, O God, for such a wonderful word. Thank you for the mysteries which are hidden there. Thank you, uh, each that we pull out speaks of Jesus our Lord. Thank you that in his goodness we too can share. For all eternity we shall sing to you our praise. Yes, from this time forth and for eternal days. Hallelujah and amen. amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you got me through today. Amen. I wasn't sure that was going to happen, but you did it. Thank you for the prayers of Paul and anybody else that uh, was in a part of that. And uh, how wonderful it is to be able to preach on this most marvelous of passages. I just, every single word drips of your son, our Lord Jesus. Every single word, even if it's a bit confusing, the basic message is there. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Lord, please be with each person here and anybody that's watching either by streaming or YouTube. And uh, I would ask that you would just bless them and uh, help them to want to dig deeper in your word each and every day not every seven years, but every day to open your word and to read it and to think about it. It's so marvelous. It is so wonderful. The things that are 
concealed in the old or revealed in the new. Thank you for this word. And thank you for each person here, especially our beauties, or if they're a beauty, then they're bows. And uh, we just pray that uh, there'll be harmony among the uh, lovers today as they celebrate uh, a day of fellowship in uh, their love for each other. And Lord, we above all, you are our greatest love and we send you our love and we do so in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You get the instruction for the Lord's Supper directly from the uh, Bible. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And there Paul wrote these words for us. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and he would have given thanks over this bread with these words. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed us as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ.
the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 Lord, it is so good to be in Sarasota, Florida. Mm -hmm. It is so nice mm -hmm. to be here where it's warm, and thank you for each person that's here, and mm -hmm. pray for anybody that might be watching right now that's in the cold, that they would be warm in their hearts and uh, feel your presence surrounding them. And Lord, just thank you for the week behind us. Thank you for whatever lies ahead in the week before us and no matter what happens just give us enough strength to praise you and with that we'll be satisfied we love you and we do praise you in jesus name amen, amen. amen. amen.